Thank you for having me back. Last one. All right, you don't have to look so happy. Um, so that's been three, three messages from me, three months. That's gone quick. For some of you, it might have felt a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, thank you. It has been, I just want to say what a privilege it has been. I have loved coming along. Um, it's really touched my heart. Um, I think I shared right at the start that I was in that place where I thought God had sort of forgotten me or finished with me in this sort of arena and preaching and doing this sort of thing. So for you to invite me back certainly lifted my spirit, lifted my heart, and you just think, wow, maybe he hasn't forgotten me. Um, I might have blown it over these last three months, we don't know. Um, but anyway, I've loved it. It's been a privilege and an honor, so thank you. I just want to start really by saying, obviously last weekend was Easter, wasn't it? And actually we should celebrate Easter and Christ risen every day of our lives as followers and believers. We shouldn't just wait for Easter Sunday morning. It should be every morning you wake up, we should declare, he's risen. Hallelujah. Shouldn't we? That's how we should live our lives. And I was just thinking and pondering on it over Easter and this week that, do you know, we sometimes think that the greatest suffering Christ went through was the sort of physical side of it. And it was horrendous. I mean, they, they say it was one of the most brutal ways to kill someone. The physical beatings, the, beat, the, the whips and the lashings, the, the nails, the, the spear in his side. But do you know what? That wasn't the worst part of it for Christ. That wasn't his greatest suffering. His greatest suffering was receiving the sin of all mankind. Our beautiful perfect Jesus received your mess and my mess and every man and woman that's ever walked this planet and ever will walk this planet he took all of that upon himself now that breaks my heart just to think of my own mess that he carried for me let alone the world's we're told that he sweated droplets of blood. That wasn't, I don't think, because he knew about the physical pain he was about to face. It was because he knew he was going to carry your mess. He knew he was going to receive the very wrath of God as he hung there. The Father himself would turn his face from him because of you and because of me. That was the greatest pain he went through and we've just remembered that the greatest miracle that happened on Easter Sunday wasn't the fact that Christ raised from the dead do you know that if you really believe who he was that was nothing the great I am the creator of heaven and earth the one who threw stars into sky. Did you really think death itself could hold him? Not a chance. It was a walk in the park for our Jesus. The greatest miracle on Easter Sunday was that you and I get to be reconciled with Almighty God. That is the miracle of Easter. That is the greatest thing that ever happened. So when you wake up on a morning... Or when you celebrate Easter and you declare he is risen, you declare he is risen so I am risen. He is risen so I can live. He is risen so I am set free. That is the greatest miracle that ever happened. Hallelujah. And we've just celebrated it. And as we've heard, there's coming a day. There's coming a day. And I, I long for that day. It doesn't scare me. I ain't worried about it. I am coming to a day when I will get to stand with him and that party will be wild. It will be wild. And we'll get to spend all eternity in that. Isn't that great? Anyway, morning. Hope you're awake. Hope you're ready. I'm fired up, as you can probably tell. I love preaching. I love declaring Christ. There is nothing better. 
Is there? I don't think. So for me, I'm sorry, sometimes you get me a little bit excited. Sometimes you find I get a little bit raising me voice and a little bit movie, but I can't help it. I can't help it. I love seeing you smile. <laughs> Your testimony this morning has just blessed me so much. It really has. The goodness of God. The goodness of God. Anyway, so let's get started. Let's get cracking. So as you remember, we've been looking at encounters. Um, we've done, this will be the third one. So our first encounter um, was about the woman at the well. For those of you that were here, um, for those of you that were lucky enough to miss it, just a quick recap. We looked at this woman at the well. She received the gift of God. She received the gift and the spirit of God. And then she is just radically changed. And she goes back to her town, this messed up woman. Her life's a mess. Five husbands and boyfriends and all sorts. She's just a, an outcast. And her whole town is evangelized and challenged and changed just by her testimony. Wonderful encounter. We then looked at Peter. This wonderful character in scripture. I love Peter. And as you remember, he meets Jesus. And he's just overwhelmed by his own sinfulness. He just becomes so aware of who he really is. The mess that he really is. He realizes he needs a savior. Jesus tells him, just follow me. That's all I want you to do to start with. Just follow me. And he follows and then he becomes this great fisher of men. And we read in Acts how he boldly declares Christ to his dying days. So the third person we're going to look at this morning, drum roll, who could it be? There's so many we could look at. I've chosen to look at the sick woman. Ooh, the sick woman. She's declared and described in three of the Gospels. She's never really given a name, and she's always referred to as the sick woman, or the bleeding woman. Like, not, the, not that bleeding woman, the bleeding woman. So here she is. We're going to come across her. We're going to look at her account. Again, she has this amazing encounter with Jesus, but it's only short. Just this short, strange encounter that just changes everything and declares some of the greatness and goodness of who Jesus is. Because let's be honest, out of all these three preachers, all I've been trying to get to hear you to tell you is how good Jesus is. That's all I'm here to do. To be honest, I'm not really that interested in the characters. I'm interested in Jesus. I want you to leave here just so encouraged by who your saviour is. That's what I want you to leave with. Not that we're leaving encouraged by these characters and these people. They're just like you and me. Your story could be in scripture of your wonderful encounter with Jesus. I just want us to leave encouraged by him. So that's where I'm trying to get us to. So before we read this account, and if you want to start turning there now whilst I just ramble on a little bit, it's going to be in Mark 5. We're going to look at his account. So Mark chapter 5, and we find it sort of snuck in the middle of several things that are going on. You might find it titled, A Dead Girl and a Sick Woman. What a lovely title for a passage in Scripture. It's really an encouraging one, isn't it? It's sort of like, I want to read that. Um, but that's what it's called, Dead Girl and Sick Woman. But before we rec rec sort of look at this, let's just look at what's already happened in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. And I, <laughs> I love just reading some of the stuff. And there's always the same thing that Jesus is trying to get everyone to do, to see him for who he is. That's, that's all he's doing. In every account, he is literally declaring, I am the great I am. I am God himself. That is all he's doing constantly. Look at me. I am the savior of the world. I'm going to show you why and how. And that's what he's doing all the time. And we see in these sort of short 24 hours, he just declares his authority and power over just about everything. So it starts, if you go back a little bit, it's actually started with Jesus calming the sea. So they're traveling over to this place called Gesseans, where the Gesseans live. And that's where he's traveling over. This great big storm rages. 
And that's where it starts. So he's fast asleep in a boat, just chilling, as you would. Nothing's going to affect him. Storm's raging. Disciples are panicking. We're all doomed, Mr. Mannering. We're going to die. And they're all panicking, and that's where it starts. And then Jesus, as you know, just, what's wrong with you all? Gets up, says, waves, just, shh, stop. And the storm is going, whoosh. I love that. Just great, isn't it? He just says, Psh. what does he declare? I have authority over the physical realm. I have authority over the, the wind, the weather, the sun, the sun. I control it all. Let me show you. Waves, settle. Storm, stop. Instant. We don't hear him praying. We, he doesn't get on his knees and cry out. He doesn't beg to Father. He doesn't do any of that. He just says, quiet. Bang, done. Even the waves obey him. Isn't that amazing? And I love, I, just, I love the disciples because they're just like you and me. What do they say? Who is this? <laughs> I love it. So if you look back in chapter 4, right at the start, Verse 41, they were terrified and they said, who is this? Who is this? Who is this that controls even the storms and the weather? Whew, isn't it great we know who he is? He is the I am. Storm, be quiet. Whew. I love it. His day gets even more chaotic. He arrives on this Lake Island. So he gets on there, this town, village, whatever it is. And he's confronted with this demon-possessed man who's absolutely raging mad. He's screaming and shouting and he's caused chaos in these villages and towns, obviously for years. And he comes running up to Jesus with all the demonic stuff in him, just runs up to Jesus. And he starts yelling at him and starts shouting at him. And he sh shouts at Jesus and he says, what do you want with me? Son of the Most High. Disciples have just declared, who is he? We're terrified. He's now confronted by the whole demonic in this man. Isn't that interesting? Even demons know who he is. In fact, they knew who he was before we knew who he was. Why? Because he is the great I am. They know the very presence of God has stepped onto their island. And this demon-possessed man and all the demons in him couldn't control themselves. And they come running up to Jesus in full confrontation mode, ready to scream and yell, what do you want with us, son of the most high? The demons knew who he was. <laughs> Jesus just calmly casts them out. If you remember the story, if you've got time to read it, go back and read it. The demons start talking. Who are you? We're legion. There's many of us, hundreds of them inside this poor man's life. Just ravished with the demonic. Doesn't tell us how, what. He's ravished with them. And they ask Jesus, just send us somewhere. And there's a herd of pigs, and he says, yeah, go into there. And they go in, and all hundreds of them just run into the lake and kill themselves. Power that Jesus has over the physical realm and the spiritual realm, declared in less than a few hours. I wonder if his disciples are beginning to grasp who it is that was in the boat with them yet. Who is this one that calms the storms, casts out demons? And there's this lovely bit then where the man's now suddenly, he's like, just calm. He's like, oh my gosh, I'm whole again. I'm free. And he begs Jesus, can I come with you? Can I come on your missionary journey? And Jesus says, no. Go back to your family. Tell them of the mercy of God. And yet again, his testimony, we read, the people are amazed by his testimony. 
Have you noticed there's a pattern in every encounter that we've looked at so far? These people don't go and suddenly do a great big Bible study on how to be an evangelist. They don't get all the answers. It doesn't tell us that go on some course on how to be an evangelist. They don't have all the answers. They haven't figured everything out. Some of them don't even know what's really happened to them. They don't understand it. But what they do have is a testimony. What they do have is a story. And what they can do is tell people. That is a great evangelist. You are all great evangelists. Because you've all been radically saved by Christ. All you have to do is tell your story. Isn't that wonderful? I think that's great. It encourages me because I don't have to have all the answers. I just have to tell people. Let me just tell you about someone in my life that's changed me. His name's Jesus. Don't worry about the questions. Don't worry about what you might get asked. Just tell them. Isn't he good? Amen. So Jesus then, so this is still in the same day. That's just happened. All that incredible stuff. He now gets back in the boat and they row across and they get back to the other side. There's another large crowd that's now gathered. So there's rumblings happening. Word is spreading. There's something happening. We've heard he's calmed some storm. We've heard he's cast out demons. We need to see this. And there's a crowd gathering. They want to listen and hear. And what is going on? Chaos is kicking off. And then he's approached. As soon as he, as soon as he gets off, he's now approached by Jairus. Temple leader, religious man. And he begs Jesus, my daughter's dying. My daughter's dying, I need you. And Jesus agrees to go with him. And he starts the journey through the crowd to go to Jairus' house. And then we read, and this is the bit we're going to look at, of this really strange encounter. In the middle of all that's just going on, we read of this woman that comes. And it even seems strange to the disciples. I should imagine very frustrating for Jairus. Because actually, if you read the whole bit... Jairus starts with, my daughter is dying. He then gets held up by this account we're going to read. And news comes to say, it's too late. She's died. We ain't got time to look at it. But then Jesus shows that he is also the author and perfecter of life itself. And has the power to raise the dead. From we'll look, You can look at that in your own time. So in just a short period of time... He has declared his authority over just about every realm we have. So, let's look at this strange encounter. Mark 5, verse 24 to 34. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? I almost sense the disciples laughing a little bit at him. You see the people crowding against you? His disciples answered, and yet you can ask who has touched me? It's like, are you mad? Everyone's banging into you. There's a crowd here. And you're asking who? But Jesus kept looking around to see who'd done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be, pre and be freed from your suffering. Hallelujah. What a great image. So you've pictured it. Mass crowd 
Jesus is trying to push around. He's being led by Jairus. The disciples are around. The people are banging and pushing and shouting probably, and trying to get a word in. And then suddenly he stops and turns. We're told that this woman had been suffering for 12 years. She'd suffered under doctors who tried to make her well, but in fact, they'd made her worse. She'd spent all of her money, so we now know she's in debt. And as a Jewish woman, because of what she was going through, she would have been classed as unclean. Now, again, I've read this many times, as you will have, over the years. And I've always just focused on the physical. Here was a, because it's decided, here's a sick woman. I don't think her physical sickness was her biggest problem. Her biggest problem was that she'd been abandoned and isolated. She could no longer worship with her family. In fact, she could no longer touch her family. If she touched anything, it became unclean. She'd become isolated. She was broke. She was now an outcast. She would have felt abandoned by her religion, her faith, and her people. Don't tell me her biggest problem was physical. This poor woman would have been so depressed, so lonely, so desperate. She had nothing. And being a woman as well, she had everything against her. So please don't think of this just as a physical healing. She, I can't even imagine what must have been going through her mind. I wonder if this was just her last ditch attempt. Nothing had helped her. Nothing had got there. Doctors failed her. Religion had failed her. The laws had failed her. Everything had failed. But now she hears, hears Jesus is in town. Now, I've also heard that this was just a, a random step of faith that this woman did. That she just somehow thought, I'll just try it and see. That I'll just see if this works. Almost trying to grab his attention. I think she knew exactly who Jesus was. I think she knew like the demons knew. This is the son of the living God. This is the great Messiah that I've been waiting for and we've been waiting for. She knew Jesus was in town. She knew the great I am was in her area. And she knew I have to get to him. He's my only hope. She reaches out and grabs the hem of his garment. It's really clear. It's the hem of his garment. She doesn't touch his shoulder. She doesn't grab anything. She grabs the very hem of his garment. She sneaks through the crowd, nice and low, and she's grabbed the hem of his garment. Why? Because she knows. She knows her scriptures. She's a Jewish woman. She's been brought up in this. She knows the significance of the garment that a male Jew would wear. What does it tell us in Numbers? Numbers 15, verse 37 to 39. You see, I love this about Scripture. I love this about Jesus. He is the complete fulfillment of all the past into the new. He's fulfilling everything. And yet again, we see him fulfilling the promises that the chosen people, the Jews, had hung to for centuries. And even in this small, tiny, little encounter, he's declaring, I am. I am the fulfillment of everything that was ever declared. Numbers 15, 37 to 39. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, throughout the generations to come, you are to make tassels on the corners of your garments with a blue cord on each tassel. You will have these tassels to look at. And so you will remember 
all the commands of the Lord, that you may obey them and not prostitute yourself by going after lusts of your own hearts and eyes. Then you will remember to obey all my commands, and I will con consecrate to you your God. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. Every Jewish man, again, it's repeated in um, Deuteronomy 22, verse 12. It tells us, make tassels on four corners of your garments. It carried way back from numbers, right from the day of Moses. Every Jewish male would wear their garments, even if they weren't fancy, and they would tie in the corners on the hems of their garments, these cords, these tassels, to remind them that they were gods and who God was. Tied in the garments on all their clothes. Okay, so that's fine. But what else does it tell us? So she knew something of this. She knew that the garment was significant. We're even told a little bit more about how, how hugely significant and symbolic they were. If you remember Saul and King David or King Saul at the time and David, Saul's become really jealous of David. He knows David's one day going to be king. David's becoming so popular. Everyone loves David the warrior. And Saul is so, so jealous. And he's out to kill David. Awful story. And he's out to get rid of him. But God says to David, David, I'm going to bring Saul. I'm going to bring him before you. You're going to have an opportunity to make your own decision, whether you take his life or spare his life. And if you remember the account where, well, we'll read it. David is hiding in a cave, just hiding from Saul's armies. And then God delivers Saul right into his hands. It tells us that Saul comes into this cave to relieve himself. But little does he know that David and his armies are hiding deep down in the back of this cave. But what's so significant about this, you say, Simon? What on earth has this got to do with a woman that's grabbed Jesus in a crowd? We'll get there. Don't worry. It will all make sense. 1 Samuel, chapter 24. This is the account. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Lovely how they just give us all the description. We need to know that. Uh, he's only human, I suppose. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said, To you I will give you your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. So there's the promise. There's the reminder. This is your chance, David. It's now up to you. All David had to do was get his sword. He could come behind. But he doesn't. Stop laughing. Is it just me that looks at things like this? It's not, is it? You're just the same. Then David crept up unnoticed. What does he do? Do you want me to tell you what he did? I'm sure you know. Then David crept up unnoticed. Oh, what did the woman do in the crowd? She crept up unnoticed, did she? And he cut the corner off Saul's robe. Just quietly, didn't make a noise. Cuts the corner of his robe. Why? Because it's so significant. The, the corner of Saul's robe was his declaration that he is king that he is God's anointed one. David's now come and cut the corner and taken it for himself. Afterward, David was conscious stricken of having cut off the corner of his robe. And he said to his men, Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed for the, of the Lord. With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went away. So David spares Saul's life, but removes the corner 
of his robe, takes the tassels out of one of the robes. In verse 20, we can then read, I won't read it now, but David then stands before Saul and shows him what he's got. Saul realizes David could have taken his life. He knows he's been spared. But also what's really fascinating is Saul declares, now I know that you will be king one day. Because he now held the standard, the royal standard, the royal stamp. He held it in his hands. The significance of this corner. So there's something significant. There was, a, there was an understanding in Jewish people that there was such power and significance in the robes, in the tassels of a Jewish man's garment. But there was also another truth that this woman would have heard. This, she would have been taught this. And it was a, a, a first Jew sort of, they understood this, that when the Messiah come, he'd have healing in his wings. And we see it in scripture. It talks about the Messiah coming with healing in his wings. There's several scriptures about it. You think, well, okay, she's not touched any wings. Jesus didn't walk around with a big set of wings sticking out. That would have looked weird. Malachi 4, verse 2 to 4. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And you will go free, leaping with joy like calves let out to pasture. Isn't that lovely? Lovely description. (laughs) Leaping like calves. So when we go out of here this morning, we can leap like little calves, (laughs) bouncing around to our cars. So, (laughs) sorry. The Hebrew word, the Hebrew word for corners the Hebrew word for corners is also translated wings. Did you know that? The word flips between the two. Wings and corners are translated exactly the same way. So the first century Jews were waiting for a Messiah to come who would have healing in his wings, who would have healing in his garments who would have healing in the hem of his very garment. This woman didn't push through the crowd in a a sort of a hopeful, glancing touch. This woman knew who Jesus was. He is the Messiah. All I've got to do is creep through this crowd and grab hold of his hem because There's healing in the wings of the Messiah. And she does it, and she's healed instantly. And again, she's not just healed physically. She's completely set free. He says to her, go in peace. Go in peace. The turmoil has left. I bet she left that crowd like a little leaping calf. Set free. She went for healing and she was made whole again. She went for healing and she was brought back into relationship with Almighty God. You see, she received spiritual, physical, and emotional healing in an instant because she touched the hem of Jesus. She wasn't the only one. If you then read on in Mark chapter 6, verse 57, it tells us this. And wherever he went into villages, towns, or countrysides, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched were healed. I think, I like to think, that woman started something. That moment 
of her knowing who he was, she started a little revelation that wherever Jesus went, people try to grab him. <laughs> Can you imagine him trying to walk through the crowd like I can't move anywhere? And, and then you could imagine, I just have this lovely image as he's walking through the crowd, dragging his cloak off everybody. There's people leaping and bouncing behind him. Woohoo, I'm healed! So, just a great image, isn't it? Oh, I've got to stop reading the Bible like this. Just amazing. This strange, small account, this strange encounter of a sick woman. She knew who he was. She just touched his hem, and she's radically set free. Hallelujah. Do you know what? This morning, you and I, we don't need to push through any crowds. You don't have to queue up to see Jesus. You don't have to make an appointment like trying to see your GP, which is a miracle if you get one, or your MP. You don't have to do any of that. Jesus is in our midst right now, freely available. And he's crying out for you just to come and touch his hem. I don't know where you're at. I've only been here a few times. I don't know all of you. I don't know your backgrounds, which is good. I don't know where your walk is with Jesus. This might be the church of perfect people. That's what Alan told me. You might have your life so sorted and lined up with Jesus. You might be the greatest testimony sharers that there's ever been. And if that is the case, God bless you. May it continue. But I know people. I've been around long enough. I know that as I look around this room, you'll have hurts. You'll have baggage that you're carrying from years ago. You'll have sicknesses, and pains and hurts. You'll be suffering with depressions and things that have just messed with your head. You'll struggle to see yourself as he sees you. I want to tell you, Jesus is here today. I can't do anything for you. I can pray with you. I can encourage you. I can stand out here and dance and prat about and tell you how wonderful my Jesus is. He and he alone can set you free. And like I said, there's no crowd to push through anymore. He's just waiting. He's just saying, come to me. Come to me. Let me set you free. Let me walk this journey with you. Let me carry some of the weight. Let me heal you. Let me love you. Let me love you like you've never been loved before. Let me remind you of what I carried on the cross for you. So maybe this morning it's about first encounters. Maybe it's about fresh encounters. Maybe this morning's the day you say, do you know what, Jesus? Let's go for this. However long I've got left on this planet, let's you and me go for something. Maybe you've drifted. Maybe it's dark time to come back. Healing. Physical, spiritual, emotional. You can do it all. Sometimes not all in one hit. But he'll walk it with you. I just want to finish. because we've look at that. I've, I haven't been that long this morning, have I? No. Only about two and a half hours. So that's really good going today. I want to finish if I can, because I wasn't going to do this, and I, it just came to me this morning as I was driving here. And it fits with communion. It fits with what I said at the beginning. And I want you to take it as a reminder of who it is that stands in heaven. 
You see, the man that stands in heaven, yes, he's physical. He still has the scars that he took on himself. But let me tell you something about my Jesus. He's no meek, mild, defeated man still stuck on a cross. You see, in the book of Revelation, it tells us who's waiting to return. There's a part of me that gets excited, scared. There's a godly fear that comes on me as I read this. As I watch the news, like many of you do, I have an image. I have an image that in heaven, Jesus is waiting. And stood behind him, there are legions of angels. And don't think angels as little fluffy cherubim things with little wings. These are mighty warriors. You read of some of the descriptions of angels, and people have seen angels in the scriptures. These are huge beings, powerful and strong. Legions upon legions upon legions stood behind the commander-in-chief of the armies, which is Jesus. And they are simply waiting from the nod from the Father to say, now go. It's coming. It's coming. Make sure you're ready. It's coming. But let me read you, because I love this. Because every time the enemy comes at me, every time he thinks and he reminds me of my failures and my faults, I just love this description of Jesus. And then we'll finish. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. Hallelujah. We live in a world now where we don't even know what's true anymore. Truth is your truth, they tell us. Rubbish. Jesus stands there as the Faithful and True. With justice, He judges and makes wars. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. (laughs) Don't you love this? He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Do you know why they're riding on white and white and clean? Because the battle to them is nothing. They ain't going to get muddied up. This is a no-lose battle they're entering into. They can wear their Sunday bests. Here we come. Here we come, demons. Here we come, world. Here we come, mess of this place. We're coming dressed in white. That's how, that's how strong and powerful. Out of his mouth comes a sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. I love this bit. On his robe. Oh, we've just been looking at robes and garments. On his robe. Now he's got a tattoo. On his thigh. He has the name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. That who stands in heaven, waiting for the trumpet call to come and bring you home. That is who you're going to meet when you close your eyes for the final time. When your heart beats its final beat, you will see the rider on his horse. And you will see his robe and you'll see tattooed on his leg, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And you will know you stand before the great I Am. Hallelujah. 
May God bless you. I'd love just to pray with you as we close, if that's okay. So please, if you want to, bow your heads, close your eyes, and let me pray. Father God, hallelujah. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he is the great I am. We thank you that we no longer need to push through crowds, that he's here right now. And I pray that as in our hearts, we think of those things we, we really need you for, Jesus. I pray now you'll touch individuals. Individuals will just sense your presence. That as this day unwinds, as they go about the rest of today, they'll sense your presence. They'll sense you close. And they'll sense you doing a new thing in their lives. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.